Good afternoon and thank you for being with us. Uh, my name is Michael Muti. I'm the immediate past president of the Northeast Ohio chapter of the American Constitution Society and I had the distinct privilege of moderating today's event. In the wake of George Floyd's killing and the ensuing demonstrations, our national conversation over the last two months is focused on systemic racism and police violence. These issues, of course, are not foreign to our community. George Floyd could have happened here. Indeed, police killings akin to his have happened here. In 2012, dozens of police cars chased Timothy Russell and Melissa Williams in a tragedy that ended with 13 officers firing 137 shots and killing them both. 2014 saw both Tanisha Anderson and Tamir Rice die at the hands of Cleveland police. Those four people are memorable, but they're far from the only victims of police violence here in Cleveland. Five years ago, the city and the US Department of Justice entered into a historic consent decree to ensure that Cleveland residents will receive the type of policing that our constitution entitles them to. In 2015 and 2016, our chapter and community partners, including the NAACP, the ACLU, and the Cleveland Marshall School of Law and Alumni Association held a series of events addressing the process. We're convened here today to discuss how far we've come and how far we have yet to go. Throughout today's discussion, I have a challenge for each of you. Ezra Klein writes, quote, we give too much attention to national politics where we can do very little to change and too little attention to state and local politics where our voices can matter much more, end quote. I think he's right. And I'm as guilty as anyone of falling into this trap. Today's topic presents an antidote to that tendency. Policing happens in our communities. Police reform happens or doesn't happen close to home. Throughout today's program, I challenge each of you to get out a notebook and jot down some opportunities where you can spend your time, your attention, and your efforts on matters that are close to home. Before I introduce our panelists who will guide us on today's journey, a few words of thanks. First, a word of thanks to ACS for providing a platform to hold these important discussions. Next, to the Knoxville and Los Angeles chapters of ACS for joining us and co-sponsoring today's event. Third, to our own Carolyn Batt for setting up the logistics for today's event. And fourth, and definitely not least, to our three phenomenal panelists who I'll introduce now. Carol Rendon is a partner at Baker Hostetler. Before joining the firm, she spent eight years as the Northern District of Ohio's first assistant U.S. attorney and then its U.S. attorney. In those cap capacities, Carol was instrumental in the negotiation and early stage implementation of the consent decree. Carol's accolades are too many to list, but they include clerking on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, serving as the chief of the Organized Crime Task Force for the U.S. Attorney's Office in Boston, and of course, receiving our chapter's 2017 Stephanie Tubbs Jones Award for Distinguished Public Service. Carol, thank you for being with us. We're thrilled to have you today. Thank you, Mike. Next, Aisha Bell Hardaway is Assistant Professor of Law at Case Western Reserve University School of Law and the Director of its Criminal Clinic. Her research and scholarship interests include the intersection of race and the law, constitutional law, criminal law, policing, and civil litigation. She's currently putting that scholarship into practice, serving on the Consent Decree Monitoring Team as Deputy Monitor, where she and her 20 colleagues serve as the court's agent in implementing the consent decree. She's a graduate of the College of Worcester and Case Western School of Law and a veteran of the Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office and Tucker Ellis LLP. Uh, Professor Hardaway, thank you for being here with us today. And thank third- Thank you for having me, thank you. Thank you. A and third, hopefully, barring um, further technical difficulties, we'll have Gordon Friedman joining. Uh, Gordon Friedman is a civil rights 
and criminal defense attorney and a founding member of Friedman and Gilbert here in Cleveland. As a criminal defense attorney and adjunct professor of law at Cleveland Marshall College of Law, Gordon has developed a much deserved reputation as a defense attorney's defense attorney. He received his law degree from George Washington University and relevant here, he currently serves on the Community Police Commission, which the consent decree established to provide community input on police policies to help strengthen relationships between officers and the communities they serve. So Gordon, we hope the technical issues abate and, and you're able to join. Um, we're gonna proceed today through uh, looking at, starting with where we've been, uh, where we are, and then where we're headed. So to, to start today's discussion, uh, Carol, could you tell us a bit about what led to the investigation that in turn led to the consent decree? Sure, so uh, turning us back in time, uh, as Mike mentioned earlier in his introductory remarks, on November 29th of 2012, Timothy Russell and Melissa Williams were killed after an incredible police chase involving a multitude of police cars that went from Cleveland into East Cleveland. It was one of many incidents uh, that were of concern. Uh, but in the wake of that very public incident, Mayor Jackson and others, uh, public figures and private figures, called on the Department of Justice to start what is called a pattern and practice investigation. There's a specific statute that was passed in the wake of the Rodney King beating in Los Angeles. It is at 42 USC 14141, and it allows the Department of Justice to engage in an investigation, not to look at a specific officer or a specific incident, but rather to look to see whether or not a police department as a whole is engaging in inappropriate patterns and practices. So we launched that investigation in March of 2013, I was a member of the team that conducted the investigation. The investigation team was made up of lawyers from the U.S. Attorney's Office in Cleveland, and also from the Department of Justice, the Civil Rights Division, as well as a group of consultants and experts, police experts, who participated in the investigation with us. And during the course of that investigation, we did a lot. Uh, we reviewed uh, tons of documents, over 600 use of force reports. We interviewed witnesses. We conducted town hall meetings. We met with stakeholders, community leaders, religious leaders, public officials. We met with the police department. We met with the command staff and supervisors. We met with patrol officers. We went on ride-alongs in every division of the Cleveland Division of Police on every shift. We talked to just about anybody who would talk to us and gathered a tremendous amount of information. We met with the Office of Professional Standards, the Civilian Police Review Board, and many, many others. That investigation uh, was not an easy undertaking. It took us approximately a year and a half to complete that comprehensive investigation. We wanted to make sure we knew everything that we could about what was going right and what was going wrong within the Division of Police. And shortly after Tamir Rice was shot and killed in November of 2014, on December uh, 4th of 2014, we issued what, we, what is called a findings letter. It was a report to the community of what we had found during the course of our investigation. And what we found was that we had reasonable cause to believe that the Cleveland Division of Police engaged in a pattern or practice of the excessive use of force in violation of the Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution. And that use of force included both lethal and non-lethal force. And we found that that, ex that pattern of the excessive use of force manifested itself in a number of different ways. And they included the unnecessary use of deadly force, including shootings and head strikes using the butt of a, of a firearm as an impact weapon, the unnecessary, excessive, and retaliatory use of less lethal force, including tasers, chemical sprays, and hard strikes with a closed fist. And that sometimes included retaliatory use of force, which is never permitted when a, a subject had already been subdued and was in handcuffs. Um, we also found that there was an excessive use of force against persons who were mentally ill or in a mental health crisis. Cases often where the officers were not called to the scene because a crime had been committed, 
but rather a call for service because somebody needed help that then devolved into an inappropriate use of force. And the employment of poor and dangerous tactics, which placed both the officers and the community in dangerous situations. And so we tried to figure out also why this had happened. And what we concluded was that there were structural and systemic deficiencies within the Cleveland Division of Police that included insufficient accountability, inadequate training, insufficient resources for the officers, insufficient equipment, ineffective policies, and an inadequate engagement with the community. And so all of those things combined together over a long period of time had resulted in what we saw as a pattern or practice of the excessive use of force. One of the things that we found uh, in the course of that investigation was that oftentimes, although force might be justifiable in the moment that it was used, if you backed up the tape, there were many opportunities where the police could have de-escalated the situation. And instead, they often did escalate the situation. And so one of the things that we wanted to really focus on in the negotiation of what ultimately became the consent decree that was entered in this case was the importance of training and policies and the use of de-escalation techniques. And so having found all of these um, issues, we issued a report to the public. Um, there was a press conference and our findings letter was made available on the U.S. Attorney's Office's website. And we then started the process of negotiating a resolution with the city of Cleveland. And that took several months, uh, but we ultimately in March of 2015, reached an agreement with the uh, City of Cleveland and the Cleveland Division of Police that was entered as a settlement agreement in the United States District Court for the Northern District of Ohio. The case was drawn to then Chief Judge Solomon Oliver, and as a result of a number of hearings that he held, that decree was entered as an order of the court. And so now one of the things that Professor Hardaway will be talking about is the fact that that decree is a court-ordered decree. And so it can't be revoked. Uh, a change of administrations can't change the course of such a decree because it's already a court order and it has and will be enforced. And I'm gonna highlight just a couple of the key provisions of the consent decree and then turn it over to talk about how the consent decree has been um, implemented. So we wanted the consent decree to focus on changing the problems that we found. And so the consent decree really does a number of things. It required a lot of new policies and procedures on the use of force, a new bias-free policing policy, a tremendous amount of work on crisis intervention, training our officers to be guardians of the community and teaching them how to effectively de-escalate situations uh, where they could. Training on searches and seizures and new policies on that. And then a lot of accountability because if you don't know what the officers are doing on the street, you don't know whether things are getting better or worse. So a lot of data collection and analysis and accountability to ensure that the new policies and procedures weren't just great words written on a piece of paper, but were in fact becoming embedded in the culture and the conduct of the Cleveland Division of Police. And then of course, because we saw an issue with training and with support, we wanted to make sure that the officers had the training that they needed, the resources that they needed, the equipment that they needed, to do what is a very difficult and very dangerous and very important job really well for the people who live and work here in the city of Cleveland. Um, and a big part of that process was uh, making sure that it was gonna be effectively implemented. And to do that, we put in place a provision that allowed the court to hire a monitoring team as an agent of the court. So a monitoring team to work with the Department of Justice and the city of Cleveland to help implement the consent decree and to report back to the court and the community as to how that implementation was proceeding. And so with that, unless Mike, you have any additional questions or want me to highlight anything else, I would be happy to turn the microphone over to Professor Hardaway. Thank you, Carol. Um, Professor Hardaway, can, can you tell us a bit about how the monitoring team has gone about doing its job over the past five years? Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to. So um, as you mentioned in the introduction, the monitoring team is comprised of a set of individuals um, from all across the country. Uh, we started out with, I think, like 21 
Um, and now we have a core team of about 15 subject matter experts. Uh, and we work, uh, really, we work as a team to develop a work plan or an implementation process, um, as well as to conduct assessments of the more than 260 data points covering uh, more than 10 general substantive areas within the consent decree. Those areas, um, as Ms. Radon um, identified, those substantive areas include uh, such things as the use of force, accountability, community engagement and trust, bias-free policing, and transparency and oversight. Um, the consent decree requires that the monitor file with the court uh, a public report at six-month intervals. Um, and those reports are really to detail uh, the, the progress of the implementation uh, and also to highlight any challenges or concerns that the monitoring team has found with compliance. And so every six months since um, we were uh, um, installed or, or hired by the court uh, in, in September, October of 2015, uh, we have been filing um, those semi-annual reports. And over the course of the last uh, nearly five years, uh, it's hard to believe that we've actually been um, at this work. It's both at the same time hard to believe uh, and seems much longer, uh, depending upon the moment, uh, that there's been a significant amount of work undertaken by the parties, often with some form of technical assistance from the monitoring team. And for the sake of my time here in front of you, um, I'll highlight just three areas uh, that may be particular interest to our audience. Uh, the first is that um, we worked with the city and the Department of Justice to create a new use of force policy and the concomitant training uh, that would prioritize and, and that was prioritized during the first year of implementation. The new use of force policy went into effect in January of 2017 and the monitoring uh, team prior to prior to its finalization, convened a series of community conversations that involved both officers, uh, the community, and representatives from the Department of Justice to get feedback from the community on what the draft policies um, look like, how they resonated with them, and what things might be added. Uh, it also provided a really good opportunity from my perspective to engage in some educational um, conversations around use of force generally with the community and to hear their concerns about what police seen on the streets of Cleveland had looked like up until that time. Unlike the antiquated policies that other jurisdictions currently have, the new uh, Cleveland Division of Police Policy requires its officers to use force only when it's necessary, proportional, and objectively reasonable for an officer to do so. And I think that's a really important improvement. Officers are also required um, um, or, or placed under a duty to intervene, as well as the duty to de-escalate. Um, the second area that I think is worth highlighting for our audience today is civilian oversight. Uh, the city of Cleveland and its public are fortunate enough to have civilian oversight baked into its city charter. Um, most uh, municipalities, unfortunately, do not have that, and, and, and many community leaders and activists have been uh, pushing for years in other cities to have something like what we have here in Cleveland. It provides that the Office of Professional Standards with the authority, um, uh, they, it gives them the authority to investigate civilian complaints against Cleveland police officers. It, author, it also authorizes the Cleveland or the Civilian Police Review Board, my apologies, to make recommendations to the Chief of Police on the level of discipline that should be uh, meted out uh, related to uh, any misconduct allegation that has been sustained by that body. Much of the, mon um, I need to say, um, back in 2015 and early 2016, much to the monitoring team's dismay, uh, this important role was uh, gravely dysfunctional. Um, when we began our engagement, we discovered there was a huge backlog of more than 400 cases sitting with the Office of Professional Standards. And the office was drowning under the amount of work that it had, as well as its staff not having the adequate leadership or training uh, to properly fulfill its function. Uh, with the help of the court, clear expectations were set out and timelines were given for the city to address those issues uh, and to give um, that, that the, the Office of Professional Standards and the Civilian Police Review Board the necessary resources that it would need in order to function properly. And what we were able to see was that the city moved from a place of great dysfunction uh, in this department to one that has the potential of setting a clear example of what competent and committed transformation under the decree can look like. 
Um, and then the third, I know I've been talking for a little bit, so there's just one other thing, and hopefully this will dovetail nicely into um, the areas or, or the comments that Gordon uh, is going to make. But the third that I'd like to highlight um, that I think is of particular interest to this group is search and seizure. Um, and it's here where um, the city worked to develop new policies on search and seizure for the men and women um, employed by uh, city uh, police. Um, the development of those uh, policies provides a really good example of how the Community Police Commission, which Mr. Freeman is a member of, uh, as a commissioner, um, how they were able to work collaboratively uh, through a process um, to provide their insight and expertise to the city of Cleveland. Uh, the CPC brought in a group of professors and practitioners uh, who work in the area of criminal law to discuss with the city all of the relevant Fourth Amendment issues that they should take under consideration when developing not just their search and seizure policies, but also search and seizures policies specifically related to interactions with youth and interactions with the LGBTQ community. And so I think that that's really important to highlight uh, as it relates to training. The city also involved the city prosecutors in an earlier iteration of search and seizure training, which I think um, was particularly useful and instrumental, uh, a, a change from what had happened before. And so I think those are all no notable improvements for us to talk about the work of the monitoring team um, in the first five years of this engagement. I'll turn it over to Gordon um, and to see um, what he'd like to add. And, and I look forward to the conversation with all of you today. Thank you. Excellent, Chris, if you could unmute Gordon's phone. Um, Gordon, we're okay. glad you're able to join. We, we really appreciate you hopping on uh, from your vacation. And i um, wondering if you could tell us a bit about the Community Police Commission and how it's gone about its work since the consent decree. Well, I will, thank you. Uh, the commission, uh, frankly, had a shaky start in its first several years uh, of existence. Um, and um, it, though it's gained its sea legs substantially, but let me make the observation that the consent decree uh, it is uh, approximately 103 pages of strong uh, consideration. The Cleveland Police Community uh, Community Commission uh, takes up about two and a half of those pages. Uh, and it is our role as the commission, which is a 13-member uh, commission made up of volunteers that represent a cross-section of the community, which includes police officers, uh, community people, and uh, academics, uh, all who have some connection with the city of Cleveland, plus a staff uh, with an executive director and three staff members. Um, we, we have, uh, at near the end of, or in the middle of 2019, kind of were uh, able to establish uh, some credibility of the city of Cleveland, which is not easy to do, uh, in in so far as that we submitted to the city of Cleveland uh, our proposed policy changes to their GPOs regarding search and seizure, um, uh, stop and frisk, and the giving of Miranda rights, constitutional protections of citizens. Um, we were fortunate. Uh, to engage with the city, as uh, Aisha has indicated, in a collaborative discussion in which we were to able, able to argue with them why the policy changes that we proposed uh, were more in tune to the, the ideals of the consent decree and uh, to the city's benefit, uh, they have, in fact, adopted some, but not all, of our recommendations. Uh, we have also submitted to the city uh, recommendations as it relates to their interaction with uh, juvenile or youth, and as well as their interaction with members of the LGBT community. Obviously, as to the latter, members of the LGBT community help draft our 
policy recommendations to the city. So it was a truly community-based uh, process, which, quite frankly, is what the Cleveland Police Commission is supposed to be about. It's supposed to represent the community. Um, we, we have had, from the beginning, a struggle with the city. Um, and um, I guess to say that if you're going to reform an entity, there has to be an openness to reform. And there has always been an openness to change by the city, which is not unusual for the city of Cleveland. Other cities uh, have gone through the same process, maybe somewhat more successfully, such as of all places, New Orleans and Seattle. Uh, I would also like to mention that um, for the first five years, and I've been on the commission for, uh, I was on the first commission and I stayed on with uh, Commissioner Latoya Logan as to this next new commission. Uh, I, I need to give credit to the monitoring team, I think, uh, which to my mind, and this is my mind and not speaking for the commission, the, the monitoring team did a nice job of staying in touch with everybody, but within the last several months, and, and in, in fact, in the latest report, the monitoring team uh, really showed some strong leadership in criticizing the manner in which the city had been disciplining its police officers for violation uh, and abusive conduct. Uh, and they also uh, brought to task the city as its relations to the um, Cleveland Police Commission. Um, I believe uh, Professor Hardaway and uh, Commissioner uh, Monitoring Aiden Hassan, who is the head of it, uh, have done a terrific job, and I look forward to their uh, their leadership. I might also add one of the downsides of the commission is though that we are an independent body, we are really beholden to the city. We are not truly independent. And and it is the hope of many commissioners, not necessarily all, but many of the commissioners, that the commission become an oversight body, independent, and and, and not reliant on the city for finances uh, in the future. And I also will take any questions that anybody should have. Well, thank you, Gordon. Um, one of the, the things uh, I'd like to explore a little bit more is the idea of data and record keeping. Um, five years ago, in the wake of the Michael Brown killing, when journalists started looking for data, many of us were shocked at how poor the record keeping actually has been nationwide. Um, I'm interested in hearing, Carol, when you were in the investigation stage, what kind of data was available to you then? And how did you go about setting a baseline against which progress or lack of progress could be measured? So excellent question, Mike. And as we all know, you can't know what you don't know. Um, and so if you're not collecting data, you have no idea what's actually happening on the streets with the Cleveland Division of Police. So uh, for example, uh, it was before the consent decree was in place, not considered a use of force for an officer to unholster his or her weapon uh, and even display it to a suspect that they were encountering. Only if the weapon was actually used was that considered a use of force. Um, and so we had no way of knowing how often officers were unholstering their weapons and whether or not they were doing so appropriately and whether or not that was escalating a situation that otherwise could be de-escalated. So the first step was to make that a reportable use of force and then require officers to report when they had unholstered their weapon. And so a big part of the consent decree, if you take the time to take a look at it, is all about data collection so that the monitoring team and the Department of Justice and the city of Cleveland, including the Division of Police, could more accurately see what actually was happening and when force was being used and why, and whether it was being approved through the uh, accountability chain and what the end results were. So, for example, we could see the very small number of officers who were ever disciplined for 
the uh, use of force, often mostly for procedural errors, like not properly filling out a report, as opposed to the actual inappro inappropriate use of force. Um, but without collecting that data, you can't analyze what's really happening. And so there is an entirely new system uh, that has been required by the consent decree for the Cleveland Division of Police to implement to adequately collect the data so that the monitoring team, the Department of Justice and others can analyze and determine uh, how the Division of Police is performing against the metrics that are set out in the consent decree. And of course, until those metrics are met, the consent decree can continue to be extended as it recently has um, because they're not going to be allowed out from under the court order until they are in compliance with the court order. Thanks, Carol. I, I've seen some news reports recently suggesting that the uh, city of Cleveland and the Cleveland Division of Police have been a little bit less than forthcoming with some requests for data uh, by either the monitoring team or the, the Cleveland Police Commission. Um, Aisha, Gordon, uh, I'm wondering if either of you can comment on why that may be and what can be done to improve that dynamic so that we can better measure what's actually going on. Well, one area, it's Gordon Friedman here, one area of our interest is we're developing a policy regarding pursuits and vehicle pursuits, uh, which most of you know ended in a tragic death in East Cleveland of a, chi a child going to the library uh, as a result of pursuit, uh, RC pursuit by the city ending in East Cleveland. We're, we are trying to find out how many um, pursuits there were over a period of time, how many pursuits were uh, ended in death and how many pursuits or what the actual crime was that a pursuit uh, involved for. Uh, supposedly, a pursuit should not take place by vehicle unless a, uh, a violent crime has been committed. We're also grappling with the concept of what is a violent crime, but we have not had, and the city has not been totally forthcoming with that information. We've gotten drips and pieces of our request for information from the city. And and uh, after multiple letters to the chief and otherwise, and we've not gotten that information, some of the pertinent information regarding pursuits. Also at a community meeting uh, that the chief attended, he indicated uh, that there would be information forthcoming regarding the circumstances of that tragic pursuit, which ended in the death of a child going to the library, and that information has not been made public yet. Thank you, Gordon. Um, it, I'm monitoring the questions and answers that are being typed in from our uh, attendees right now. And um, related to the data thread, somebody asks if there is an opportunity or a resource uh, where people can go in order to find additional information. Um, Professor Hardaway, can you uh, direct our, our participants to some good resources for further information? Yeah, um, absolutely. So uh, a couple of things to keep in mind. The monitoring team maintains a, a website. Uh, it can be found at Cle uh, clevelandpolicemonitor.net. It has all of the reports um, that we filed with the court. Um, it has um, some, some details as it relates to officer uh, surveys um, and, and other things. It has the consent decree. Uh, um, so that is a good baseline. As it relates to specific data around particular um, subject issues, we're working really, really hard with the city to make sure that that information is publicly available on the division's website, um, and 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 we continue to work towards those to the towards those ends. Um, there is a requirement, as Carol mentioned, under the consent decree that not just uh, as it relates to use of force, unholstering, uh, and pointing weapons, uh, but that the city is reporting 
a, a variety uh, of different uh, data points related not just to use and force, but also community engagement, um, problem solving, uh, and the like. And, and so it is our goal now that we've gotten past the policy development phase, are transitioning into the training phase, um, and then um, we'll be assessing the data points uh, as they're collected and made available, that that information will become more widely accessible to the public. Um, another related question from the audience regarding data collection as how the monitoring team balances the need for data collection with the potential for fear among community members to offer the data. And the questioner gave the example of the LGBTQ community um, often not reporting to police that they're part of the community for fear of mistreatment. Mm -hmm. and uh, so issues can go unreported, unrecorded, um, but it impedes or may impede the data that we're getting. Uh, I'm curious if any of you can comment on uh, structures or devices or plans for overcoming those issues. So I don't know if Gordon was involved with the CPC at the time, but the CPC did an amazing job um, when we when they un, uh, took under uh, its 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 auspices or its wings the charge of doing a listening tour around the ways that bias is has been uh, from the from the division of police have impacted different populations or demographics within uh, our city communities. And um, they did a, a listening tour that went, um, that, that, that it interacted with our Muslim uh, community, uh, faith community, different faith community members, uh, and spent a lot of time at the LGBT center on the west side um, as a part of that listening tour. And we heard exactly what the question that's being posed uh, in the chat, uh, um, alludes to, right, that there's a concern about the way that individuals are treated because of their sexual orientation or identity uh, when they call the police department. And that conversation was, I think, very fruitful. The division, as a result of it, um, endeavored and I believe has made great strides to strengthening its relationships with um, the communities uh, that are served, serviced um, by the LGBT um, um, center uh, and those concerns. And I think um, that we always will have a way to go uh, in that effort as, as most recently identified in our search and seizure discussion because um, those biases invade every segment or section of this work and that's anybody's work, uh, but it's particularly critical uh, in policing. And so I think the more we highlight it uh, and the more we make sure uh, that people are aware of them uh, and, and work positively uh, to combat them, the better off we'll Will all be as a community. So there's some work that has started and it and it predates sort of this current conversation, uh, but it needs to continue. Uh, I would I would support the fact that the city has made strides. I would question, with all due respect, that they're great strides, but they uh, remarkably have been come have become sensitive to the LBGQ community. And the fact that they may have different issues with their police interaction and in our uh, proposed GPO with, that has been drafted largely by Equality uh, Ohio and other members of the community uh, interviewing uh, members who are taken into custody uh, regarding um, various arrests uh, and how they are classified and and the whole area which uh, remains to be controversial and and quite questionable are the whole idea of strip searches and body searches cavity searches um and um i i don't see any immediate resolution of that uh but we have been uh in discussions uh, with the city regarding the whole idea of lvcq individuals who've been taken into custody and whether or not uh, how strip searches should be conducted or if they should be conducted at all, which is where I lean in on that they should not be. Thank you, Gordon. Um, one question I have, and I'm going to try to weave in a couple of, of um, uh, lines of questions from the, the crowd here, is 
um, policing isn't a static thing. It changes over time. And so, Carol, I'm wondering if you could comment a bit on what was done in the process of negotiating the consent decree to anticipate that new issues would arise. For example, the 10-point plan that Black Lives Matter Cleveland put forward in the wake of the George Floyd killing and the May 30th protests. Um, how, how, what structures are in place to account for issues like what arose on May 30th and the Cleveland police's response to the protests? So one of the things that we try to do is just that, uh, anticipate the fact that we couldn't anticipate the future. Um, and so when you look at the consent decree, there are a lot of provisions that are put in place that require the city, the Department of Justice, the monitoring team, uh, the Division of Police and others to work with the community and to work cooperatively to uh, try to achieve certain goals that we weren't sure could be achieved in a, a set period of time or might not end up um, being what needed to be done uh, to improve policing in the city of Cleveland. And so like the work that the Cleveland uh, Police Commission did uh, when they first were, came to be, uh, there was a significant amount of input from the community and a number of town hall meetings, which I know the monitoring team continues to engage in. And so that the purpose of that is to find out what's happening in real time in the community, what the community needs, what the community wants, and to try to incorporate that uh, into the work that the monitoring team and the department continue to do as they work to bring the Cleveland Division of Police into compliance with the consent decree. So it is not, there are certain things that were static and required, uh, but then there were a lot of things that require community input, including a biannual survey of the community to determine how things are going and what needs to happen next. Um, and so it is designed to be a fluid and responsive document. I should also add, Michael, that uh, the monitoring team um, is in the process of engaging in a review of what happened uh, in the city of Cleveland uh, from the May 30th to about June 2nd. Uh, and our next semi-annual report is going to be devoted solely to a review of the city uh, and, and other law enforcement agencies um, response to uh, the protests that were occurring uh, in downtown Cleveland at that time. Um, and so I know that there are a, a couple of other different agencies and of course the city is engaging in their own review, but the monitoring team is going to do its own independent assessment of how that conduct um, 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 measured up uh, to the use of force policies and other related policies that the city is currently under uh, an obligation to adhere to. And I, I might add uh, that the Clean Police Commission has written a letter to the U.S. in Cleveland Northern District Justin Herdman and to the head of the Civil Rights Division in D.C. requesting that there's an investigation of the uh, disturbances and police interaction on May 30th. We've done so notwithstanding the fact that the monetary team is looking into it, but our community members have come forward to us and saying, well, you know, what happened, and many of them were involved in, in in those disturbances and uh, were bystanders. So we felt compelled independently of the monitoring team to make our own independent request. Not quite sure where that's gonna go, but we felt compelled to do that. Thank you, Gordon. Um, I, I'd like to pivot a, a bit right now to uh, talk about um, both some progress we made and some uh, and an area for further improvement. Um, recent reports have shown that there's been a, a notable drop in use of force incidents, and, and that's great news for all of us. Um, but reports have also found uh, that the disciplinary procedures that have been put into place may not be followed much of the time. Uh, one audit found that recommended discipline was implemented only about 24% of the time, and it suggested that, or it gave some examples. Um, for example, an officer who filed a false report saying that uh, an arrestee had stomped his foot, the arrestee spent eight months in detention 
as a result, turned out that the officer admitted that that was not the case. Um, the chief recommended firing him and instead he wound up with only a 30 day suspension. Um, can you give some uh, examples of reforms made to the police review board and um, what can be done to provide for more effective discipline of officers who, shall we say, lose their way? Yeah, absolutely. So I like the way that you've paired those two questions. I want to just make sure that for the record, we have the appropriate distinction. The police review board looks at civilian complaints um, and, and all of it ends up in front of either the chief or the director of public safety. Um, the IA investigation, which is uh, the example that you raised on the individual who was um, falsely imprisoned for eight months um, um, related to, to the incident of him being arrested in his home during a, a mental health crisis. Um, that was an IA investigation that did not come about as, a, as the result of a citizen's complaint. Um, but nonetheless, though, um, I think what you're hitting on here is exactly what uh, Gordon mentioned earlier uh, as it relates to what the monitoring team did. We engaged in a full audit to assess uh, how discipline out of specifically the director of public safety's hearing processes was going. And what we found was that the, the, the discipline that was um, uh, uh, given uh, was either not provided with sufficient rationale or basis um, and didn't indicate uh, to what level aggravation or mitigation um, um, evidence was considered and certainly in the most egregious of examples, uh, often did not result in the termination of an officer who is, uh, um, uh, has the role and responsibility of being a peace officer and all of, and all of what comes along with that uh, in the state of Ohio. And so uh, that report, I think, uh, really highlighted an area of growth for the city. Uh, the monitoring team intends to do additional audits and assessments um, at the chief level, as well as of OPS, um, and certainly of the internal affairs uh, group uh, to get a sense for where along in the chain there may be any um, breakdown, uh, and also to understand what, if anything, the city is doing well. Um, I think understanding that, you know, um, we, we do have a new director of public safety. Uh, the city has a new director of public safety that was recently sworn in, Director Carrie Howard. Um, the monitoring team is in um, regular communication with him around uh, the audit uh, concerns or the concerns that were raised out of the audit uh, so that he understands exactly what the expectations of the consent decree are, as well as sort of the be brought up to speed on, on what things were looking like before uh, he joined, um, joined in this role. Um, so I think that, that, that that's helpful. And I think there was another part of your question, Michael, that honestly I lost track of. Uh, no worries, no worries. Uh, Gordon, Carol, did either of you want to comment on well, uh, what could be done it, by discipline? My comment would be that, again, I uh, applaud the monitoring team's analysis and public criticism of the discipline uh, process that has taken place uh, regarding abuse of police officers um, and the role of the safety director uh, who in often where the chief would recommend suspension, they would, they, the uh, safety director would go in the opposite direction. It would have been my hope with, with the safety director resigning, he was, a for, he was the former chief of police of the city of Cleveland, that the city would have gone outside of the city to bring in a new safety director who had fresh eyes on the situation and the problems that are faced in the city, but rather the city did pick a, a, the city prosecutor uh, to hold that position, which I myself, who know that the, the, the new safety director well as he is one of my students, would have hoped that the city would have gone to somebody more independent and less reliant on the uh, chain of command and the chain of political command in the city. That's my criticism. That is not, I, I'm not speaking for the commission on, on that point. The only other thing I would add, Michael, is the uh, issue that we've all read about, which is the problem that even when there is appropriate discipline imposed by the safety director, that that discipline is almost always challenged 
and often overturned uh, in the arbitration process. So there's a right. layer of difficulty in terms of imposing appropriate discipline for conduct that is inappropriate. Thank you. And to follow up on, on that, Carol, um, and I'll send this to all three panelists, is there something in particular that we should be seeking to do with the arbitration process? Are there uh, ordinances or statutes that we should be, or statutes that we should be asking for that would change the composition of the arbitrator panel um, or of the pool of arbitrators who can be picked or that would narrow the types of disputes that are subject to arbitration? So a lot of, I'm sorry, go ahead. a lot no, no, of go ahead. subject to arbitration is covered by the uh, contract with the police union. Um, and so there's a whole layer of issues associated with that. But within the consent decree, one of the things that we tried to, to address uh, to help with this process was to create a new disciplinary matrix to have the city working with the Department of Justice and the monitoring team create a new disciplinary matrix because a lot of what happens is when a case goes to arbitration, the arbitrators are looking at, well, what happened to a similar officer who was uh, found to have done a similar type of, you know, uh, misuse of his or her authority. And if the discipline has always been too light, it's very difficult to hit the reset button, right? So if you're comparing discipline today with what discipline was, you know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, uh, when perhaps officers were not being held accountable the way they should have, it's hard to get to hit that reset button, and a disciplinary matrix is a way to do that. Yeah, I would I would agree with with what Carol said about the whole matrix of of disciplining police officers, and have, I really I think that's as well stated as possible. And under the circumstances, it really goes to the labor contract between city and the the police unions. All right, thank you. So we are a few minutes away from 4.30 and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. But before we close, I'd like to give each of our panelists an opportunity to offer some closing words. And especially, uh, I'd encourage you to direct those closing words at what we as members of the community can do to support your efforts and to support police reform here in Cleveland, Los Angeles, Knoxville, or anywhere else uh, where people may be dialed in from? Um, maybe I'll go first? Sure. Okay, so the first thing that comes to mind that I think is really important is uh, we've talked about the police review board today. To the extent that you live um, in the city of Cleveland, and I'm assuming that the majority of your attendees have some sort of legal analysis background, um, having uh, individuals who are able to independently review um, complaints uh, and, and, and recommendations for discipline from the Office of Professional Standards serve on the Civilian Police Review Board, I think would be a phenomenal way for individuals to be engaged. Um, and and, and they're a mayoral appointment. There's an application process for individuals to either be a mayoral appointee or to be a, a city council appointee. Uh, but I think that we should be flooding uh, City Hall with those types of applications for individuals. Um, openings always come, um, and so I think that's important. I would say the same for, not to steal Gordon's thunder, but I would say the same for being involved with the Cleveland Police Commission. We routinely have openings for this very important volunteer service that Gordon and his colleagues provide to our community. It is invaluable and I am grateful to Carol and everyone else who decided to bake that into the consent decree. Um, it is a way for our community to be uh, engaged and so when those calls for applications come I would hope that individuals you don't have to live in Cleveland you can live or work in Cleveland in order to serve on the city um, police commission. There was a question here um, and I'll put on my professorial hat here to answer the question about the war on drugs. Uh, I think if I, I think a woman named Elizabeth Hinton does a really great job of making a persuasive argument that it's really the war on crime and that's both um, that was instituted by not just a Republican that we always point to Nixon but we should also look to Johnson before Nixon and the creation of what that what that war uh, in communities during the civil rights movement uh, what that did
did to, to set the stage for what we have right now uh, with this push and pull between the federal government trying to stamp out uh, certain segments of the community, but at the same time then telling local police that they need to give them constitutional policing. We need to be mindful of that. So I will end my remarks there. Well, for my part, uh, uh, I, Professor Harwood, the hard act to follow, she's really taking most of my thunder uh, regarding the Clean Police Commission, but uh, we're made up of 13 volunteers. Actually, we're looking, uh, hoping the city will select another one. I would hope the public gets behind when the moment arises for there to be a independent uh, oversight uh, Cleveland Police Commission, not one that is reliant on the city of Cleveland. Um, we're made up of volunteers, and there's a lot to be done. We have community meetings once a month where people uh, from all parts of the city come to voice their uh, support and lack of support of what we're doing. Um, so I would recommend attending our commission meetings. They're now Zoomed, unfortunately, but uh, join them and, and uh, become involved and watch what's going on at City Hall and become politically active. Uh, there is there is now a movement to federalize all of criminal law, and I think that's quite dangerous. So in 30 seconds, all I would say is stay informed and stay engaged. So learn as much as you can about what's happening in your community. Be involved in what's happening in your community. Go to the monitors town hall meetings. Go to the uh, Cleveland Police Commission's meetings. Attend the City Council Safety Committee meetings. Be an active participant in our community and be vocal about how you, as a member of our community, want to be policed. These, this is our police department. This is our city. If you live here, if you work here, if you visit here, you are entitled to express your opinion as to how you want our community to interact with our division of police. So be involved. Thank you, Carol. And thanks to all three of our panelists, Carol, Professor Hardaway, Gordon. Um, thank you for joining us today and sharing the wisdom you've accumulated in trying to tackle this giant problem. And even more so, thank you for all of the work that you've put in here. Uh, your efforts have made our community a better place. We appreciate that, and we can't thank you enough for it. So thank you. If we were in a room, we'd have a big round of applause right now. Um, for the attendee, uh, you Clevelanders out there, if you're interested in learning more and reading up, I, I would encourage you to check out WCPN's coverage of these issues. They've done a great job. Also check out ClevelandPoliceMonitor.net and the Cleveland Police Commission's websites. They are resources full of information and they will get you motivated. They will get you excited. And next thing you know, you will be attending meetings just like Carol encouraged us all to do. Um, so I will look forward to seeing you all at the meetings. Thank you to uh, our ACS chapter here in Cleveland, our ACS chapters in Knoxville and Los Angeles. And thank you to each of you for taking some time to join us here today. Have a great day. <laughs>